The least heard people have the most important things to say. Our stories come from Appalachia. Our home is West Virginia. Together, we are telling it like it is. Together, we are spilling the Black Girl Tea. Hello, and welcome to Spilling the Black Girl Tea, a storytelling project featuring Black women who call West Virginia home. I'm Crystal Good. I'm your host for today's episode of Health and Healers, in which we discuss barriers and challenges to health care and the healers and healing practices of our families and communities. I'm honored to be here with so many amazing humans. Let's get started with some introductions. Um, Dr. Smith, would you kick us off and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, my name is Dr. Shaniqua Smith. I'm currently located in Charleston, West Virginia. I am a restorative practitioner and my work centers around joy, education, and connecting individuals to their desired opportunities. Wonderful. Tony? My name is A. Tony Young. I'm the founding executive director of Community Education Group. I call Hardy County home. Uh, and what we do is at Community Education Group, we address the growing syndemic of HIV, viral hepatitis, substance use disorder, and more, I think importantly right now, trying to figure out economic and workforce development opportunities in this region of the world. Wonderful. Dr. Cordell. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Octavia Cordon. I'm currently here in Charleston, West Virginia as well, a native of New York City. Um, I've been living in the area for a little over 21 years now. I am an educational professional, and I also run a nonprofit called Aspire Achievement Project, which we focused on connecting young adults and parents, as well as um, any, any adult member of the household to the necessary resources that they need to be successful, whatever that looks like for them. Um, glad to be here today. Glad to have you. And so I'm excited to kick this conversation off about healers and healing practices and specifically Black Appalachian traditions and practices. Um, so first question, who are the traditional healers in Black Appalachian communities and what roles do they play, Dr. Smith? I think we all have a power of to heal. And our traditional heal is sadly, from what I have learned, uh, that knowledge has been lost somewhere in our community. And we are in a space right now in a season of restoring that, that knowledge to ourselves and healing ourselves. And truly healing really starts with purpose. Because once we identify ourselves and our purpose, then life just makes the universe, God makes way for us to kind of navigate all the challenges and things that we've been going through and our ancestors been going through forever. So I think this healing, creating these spaces of knowledge and creating these spaces of us conversating and being with each other, working collaboratively and believing in ourselves is definitely healing practices that I see us restoring to ourselves. Beautiful, beautiful. Others? Uh, you know, for me, I always like to say that I think that the healing is from within and from within those that left before us. Mm -hmm. uh, because I got to tell you, I have no idea of kind of how I know what I know or why I know what I know. Uh, but I think that even if I look at sometimes people say, how is it that uh, a person that looks like you, loves like you, is leading kind of this work in the Appalachia region around health and HIV? I think it's because uh, of what the people here want and need, right, is a certain amount of healing. And I think it's the person that steps up to do it, to, that just does it. I think, and that's something that we get from our ancestors. I think it's something that we get from people that have gone before. I think it's something we get from some people that have walked the land and known the and known the pain. I think that for some reason, some of us get the the message that this is your work. And you know, like I like to always say, is that you know, many people I think struggle with or wonder why God put them on the planet. Uh, I don't. I don't have that question. Uh, I kind of know uh, that intuitively this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and, and and at this moment in my work, this is whom I'm supposed to do it for. Mm, mm, mm. Um, really quickly, I think for me, you know, and I kind of agree with both young ladies, um, for me, looking back, you know, in our history, I think a lot of the healing, you know, came from, you know, the earth, you know, a lot of the practices I've, you know, that I've learned, a lot of it came from, you know, 
the things that was, you know, brought from the earth, produced from the earth. And then also, you know, our educators and our elders at that time, you know, they utilize the things and the resources that they had at this time. And then as we slowly transition into, you know, today, what we see, you know, a lot of stuff that's been put in place for healing, you know, for example, medication and different things like that, for that matter. I think we got away from a lot of those natural things. And as time go by, you know, we've, you know, every generation learn new things within that generation and they utilize those resources. So today I do see a lot of um of that those natural elements coming back today, which is good, but it's gonna take a lot of education. Like Dr. Smith said, I think um, even myself, you know, I'm trying to learn a lot more within that rim to see how we can go back to these natural things that can bring us healing, you know, not within our ourself, but our mental self as well. So I think a lot of it, came, you know, like I said before, um, you know, from the earth, you know, so we're, I think we're slowly getting back into that. We're slowly, um, you know, meeting new people, networking, you know, new things are, you know, coming about every day. And, you know, as we continue to do that, I think we can definitely get back to that, you know, get back to the history of where the healing actually started. Beautiful. And that's one of the, the beautiful things about this conversation. I consider you all very powerful, uh, healers. And as we discuss some of these subjects, you know, nature always gives the remedy, you know, uh, beside the poisonous tree grows the tree. That's the remedy beside poison ivy grows, you know, the remedy. Um, and I always try to remember that. So um, honored to be here with you healers. And Tony, I'm going to direct this question to you to kick off. Um, but how do arts and culture um, impact your work and how are you leveraging arts, arts and culture? You know, that is a funny thing that you, you should ask is that, I mean, I, I've always said that I'm not the creative type. I'm not the arts type. I, you know, cause I can't paint, I can't draw. I sing all the time and people remind me consistently that I cannot sing, uh, but I love to do it. And I only usually know one lyric and not really, I don't really usually know all of the words to said lyric that I am singing. But what I think that the art is, is in being able to create the program, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing. I think where I, it's, it's really, weird it was much later for me in life that I realized that my true calling my true artistry was in being able to vision programs um, and now really trying to figure that out in this digital age in this social media age how do we leverage one of the things I really like to do which is to talk so you know I've had these new conversations that have popped up in a digital space uh, and the, you know, everybody on my team at first was like, you're crazy. It's not going to work. And we, I mean, I'm, I've been shocked. We've had over 200,000 views, 26, mm -hmm. you know, thousand people. They said, nobody's going to sit through a 90 minute interview. But they did. Mm -hmm. And they, and they want more, you know? So I think that figuring out how do you tell the story that you need to tell? How do you need to tell the story of a people who are unseen? How do you move people from invisible to invincible through word or through, uh, you know, digital media or through print media? But I think it is, there's an art to it. There's an art to social media, which I think we need to pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. oh. Dr. Smith, how would you say uh, that art and culture has impacted your work? Well, truthfully, not until a few years ago, I realized the importance of art. Because growing up in school, they took away arts. Arts was always a thing that I see maybe other communities fought for, we never fought for. But what I realized with art, art is a space that an individual gets to be creative. You get to build your creative muscle, like uh, Tony was saying. And if you're not in a space to be creative, then how could you trust yourself in leadership? How could you trust yourself in the unknown? How could you trust yourself to be the trailblazer to build a trail when there's no trail there? Then it clicked to me. Oh, that's why they was taking art out of my schools. That's why we don't have that space of creativity, because mm -hmm. that's something that has to be developed. And many people in my community do not get that creative space because we're just in survival mode. And then when you chronologically become an adult and you need to be creative in order to make a way for yourself, that muscle has not been grown. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I understand now the importance of art in whatever form and whatever way is very much needed in our space. And also our culture. 
we are different and we the diversity we talk about diversity equity inclusion what about the diversity of god what about the diversity that this universe gives to us and because we're unfamiliar with it we're taught to reject it mm. so culture is very important for us to open up ourselves to really realize how and a lot of times the answers are in different cultures because we all want big picture so when we work together collectively and use that wisdom, it benefits us. So art mm -hmm. is very important. And, you know, now that I notice, you know, I'm trying any way I can, you know, like Tony said, I can't draw, can't do none of that stuff, but I know the importance of allowing people to be in whatever space and just let them be free. Cause mm -hmm. art makes you free. You could just make it up. You ain't wrong. You could just make it up yourself. You know, once you learn a couple of things, you can make it up. So it is so important. And I hope that even if, you know, the school don't, uh, put this space that even as community members and you know we be having our little painting parties and different things like this and it's just calming and relaxing and space for us to grow so that's something as community members we can start implementing and make sure we intentionally create these spaces in our communities beautiful thinking about art i'm sorry can i go, go ahead all right i was gonna say um just thinking about art and culture you know, you put those two together. And I think um, Ms. Tony brought up programs and, you know, that stood out to me. And Dr. Smith, she mentioned the expressive, you know, the expression of that, which I like both. And I think both of those things is very much so entwined in yeah. the work that I'm doing right now, which I really enjoy because I don't um, like structure. You know, I like to be free. And, and I think when you think about art and culture, you, the, the two things that come to my mind is, you know, being free and being inclusive. And also not only that, but also, you know, being, having that freedom to, to express yourself. And I think that's what I look at with that and the work that I'm doing right now with um, young people, because I want to meet people where they are. I don't want them to come and try to fit into something that I'm doing. I want to be able to, when I, when I meet people, I want to be able to try to understand where they're coming from and accept them where they are. So that way, you know, whatever, whatever level or, um, you know, desire that they have within their life, you know, I'm just kind of tagging along that journey, you know, to kind of help them, you know, not so much try to put them in a box. So I just enjoy the the work that I'm doing right now because it allows me to, to be free and I'm not stuck with, you know, within a, you know, just a, a, a structured process, you know, I'm kind of free to do however I want, whenever I want, you know, and also being able to help people realize that, you know, no, there's no right or wrong, you know, with what you want to do is whatever you want to do. And we're here to provide you that support and, you know, however that looks for you, which is going to look different for everybody. So I just love, I just enjoy the freedom of, you know, that art and also um, our culture bring, because it tells us, you know, it, it gives us that opportunity to tell that story from, you know, different, different perspectives. So that's what I enjoy about it. Absolutely. And uh, Octavia, I'm going to let you kick off this question. Um, and like I said, you know, it's important that as we talk about the challenges that uh, we bring the solutions and the remedy in. So um, Octavia, what unique mental health challenges do Black women in West Virginia and Central Appalachia face and how can they be better supported? I think the biggest thing I see, and, I, and I'm just speaking for myself solely, honestly, we have to move from a space of denial. You know, I think I see, you know, a lot of us, especially me, you know, we've been, you know, through so much and we've never been able to just sit down and take a break and kind of rationalize things that we're going through, you know? So a lot of this stuff is just like Miss Tony was talking about, she's she got a pack for a month. Like we're traveling and we still got stuff packed, you know, sitting in our living room packed up. Like we've, we have been taking the time to just sit down, settle, unpack, you know, and just relax. Like we're just going, we're busy. We're going, we're going and we're going and we're going through stuff and then we're still going, we're still going, you know, we're not getting this opportunity or allowing ourselves the opportunity to just sit down reflect, relax, and express these things. But instead, a lot of the stuff that we're, you know, tackling on is still on us. You know, we're still moving, but it's still sitting on us, you know, so, and and then we we get to this point to where we're not acknowledging it, you know, like it's weighing us down, but we're, we're still stuck and not acknowledging like, hey, just like, just like someone in recovery, the first step is accepting that you have a, a problem, you know, that there's something that you, you know, you, you're against this wall and you, and you realize, oh, okay, this wall is here. I need to figure out how to get this wall down. 
but we're still, you know, we're still operating, you know, with a lot of stuff, baggage, whatever that looks like for everybody, you know, but we're not, you know, we're not taking that time to sit down and, and look and like I said, and reflect and try to remedy those things, you know, because, because busy can be, you know, exhausting, you know, and then, mm -hmm. and that leads to stress and then, you know, and then, then the list goes on and on, you know, so I think a lot of, you know, a lot of women, especially us, you know, we're, we've been taught to just, you know, it, oh, you're not sick. Oh, no, you know, that's okay. Just keep on going, you know, just keep moving, you know, but we're not sitting there allowing ourselves to take time, you know, for ourselves and just, you know, accept what it is, what is and try to move on, you know, with, you know, with purpose or, you know, with whatever, um, wellness technique that we can um provide ourselves or even opportunity or we if, or even if we feel like you know we deserve an opportunity to just sit down and relax or just take a vacation somewhere you know because we're so we got so much you know that we have bottled up and that we're holding on to so but I think the biggest thing is you know just trying to get to the point to where you acknowledge that hey I have some stuff that I, I have to let go of I have some stuff that I need to sit down hey I got some stuff I need to unpack you know, before I go to Puerto Rico, you know, I still got stuff from, you know, Spain in my book, in my bag. So, but I think we just got to really, you know, slow down, you know, and try to, you know, do that self, re self reflection within ourselves, you know, so that way we can acknowledge, you know, where to help, you know, where, where the help is needed, you know, just like if you're not feeling good, you can go to the doctor to kind of figure out what's going on. You know, we, we definitely need to kind of slow down, slow down and take that time for ourselves. So that way we can acknowledge you know, what's going on with us. Mm -hmm. Tony, how's that resonate with you? You know, it, you know, it does. And it, it does in a way, right. I think that, you know, for me, it is, I really framed out this year, 2024 with some very, very strategic goals. And I basically, you know, and I, and I, I mean, when you were speaking, I, I started just to think about, the language that I had been using and, and I think what I was sitting here thinking about is that it was important that I change the language for myself, honestly, because I had told myself that my plan was I was going to kill myself in 2024 uh, and, and, me, and kill myself in how much I was going to work and how much travel I was going to do and what my plan was. And then I was like, what if I actually manifested that? I should probably like change the language, right? <laughs> I'm gonna work. I'm gonna work really, really hard to achieve some of my goals. I mean, and I and I think I ju it just hit me as I was kind of sitting here listening to you about just kind of reframing how it uh, how it is. You know, I can't say that I don't build in um, those opportunities to take that break because I agree with you. I think that that is critically important. You know, one of the three things that of trips that I have to pack for is a trip to, to Mexico where I go to try to go every six weeks. I work while I'm there. It's a whole different vibe while I'm there. It's, um, you know, I, I cut my hours back. I trim my hours back. I reduce the number of meetings I take uh, and that sort of thing. And that becomes really, and has become uh, very, very important to me. Uh, it's made me really kind of just think about what my balance in life uh, is like. I think that, you know, I also say that I believe that when it comes to that balance on mental health, what we don't talk about is how COVID broke people. Mm -hmm. uh, COVID broke people in a way that we just don't discuss. You know, we had folks locked up in their homes for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a constant dialogue and conversation about death for two years, the imminent death of ourselves, the imminent death of our friends, our families, our neighbors, our communities, our country, our nation, our world, mm -hmm. our globe. Mm -hmm. We were inundated with it for two and a half years. And then we woke up one day and we had this, you know, this scarcity mentality, toilet paper, water, food, how we're going to get it. All of those things kind of compounded for two years ongoing. And then one day somebody said over, opened up the door and let everybody out. Never, ever stopping to take a temperature on trauma. Never stopping to take a temperature on, are you okay? Never stopping to take a temperature on, what was your loss like during that situation? Nobody took the temperature of everybody and just let everybody out. And I think the thing that I've just noticed in people is that there is a, a scarcity of compassion. There's a mm. scarcity mm. of empathy that happens in people today that I don't think I saw before before COVID. 
I think that there are people that I, I knew to be kind and caring before COVID that have an edge to them today that they didn't have before COVID. Some of it is noticeable to them. Some of it isn't. So I think the, the what do we need to do? I think that we need to stop mm -hmm. and ask ourselves, you know, kind of what was the impact of that? What was the impact on that of us as a people? What was that on the, the impact of those of us that were in um, that were still working, that were in uh, caring or charitable or giving organizations that were still out there doing work at that time? Because I think that was a different level of impact. Mm -hmm. So I think that the the mental health and the behavioral health, you know, I'm a firm believer in therapy. I think that we have to make therapy okay. I think we particularly have to make therapy okay for young women uh, mm -hmm. and young men and for boys. I think that we, you know, it's so easy for us to say to a boy, uh, particularly a young black boy, that you're, you know, you've got ADHD. Maybe that young black boy is just experienced and seen more trauma than any white person can really imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that trauma for one is really, can be super traumatic for another. I think that, you know, one of the things that we don't kind of embed into those conversations is that therapy's okay. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that some of us may need it. Uh, you know, we talk about it, you know, in the, you know, I think in the 12 step programs, they talk about, you know, jails, institutions of death, right? But what they also say is that maybe some of us need jails, institutions, but maybe some of us just need therapy too. Uh, and, you know, and that is a conversation and a dialogue I don't think that we truly like to have is that, you know, and it's OK that maybe, you know, we talk about medically uh, assisted treatment for substance use disorder. But for some reason, we can't have that conversation about an individual that's going through a major depression mm. when we know it, we see it and we say, you know, hey, sis, maybe some therapy. Hey, sis maybe it's time for you to think about medication as an option. You don't have to stay in that hole. That hole is not your home. But sometimes what we don't know is that it's okay to pull our sister or our brother out or to give our brother or our sister an exit, right? Because we don't like to talk about the exit, what the exit is. We don't want to say, oh yeah, you know what? Guess what? Hashtag me too. I had to go to therapy. Hashtag me too. There was a time where medication worked for me. Sometimes it's like you maybe you just need a set of jumper cables to get you motivated again. But then we wonder why rates of suicide go up. We wonder why folks are who are homeless or marginally housed. Folks didn't start off this way. Folks mm -hmm. ended up this way. Mm -hmm. And it's what we're going to do with our hand. Are we going to reach our hand out and say, hey, you all right? And sometimes that's all it takes. You know, my uh, my grandfather, my grandfather used to always say to me, like and back in the day, they call them bums. He would always say, "If you see a bum on the street, or you meet the president of the United States, you mm -hmm. give him the same greeting and the same salutation." Because guess what? You don't know when one's going to be the other someday. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. What well, I know for myself, um, healing and mental health, I had to learn that my value wasn't who I am and not what I did. And growing up as a child and just all my whole life, I always realized, you know, especially as a black woman, we got to go in there, we got to do it. And if you're the one that was smart enough and you know it, it was always your responsibility. And this always put me into a space of just doing, 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 doing and become a human doing and not a human being, not creating a healthy balance for myself to check myself. And like Dr. Cordon said, you don't even realize how you're doing. You don't even know that you're supposed to take care of yourself. Then you find yourself growing up and you're upset, lost, mad, angry, doing good intentions, but wrong approaches, and not realizing that we needed to fall back and love on ourselves. And it's okay to do so. And so I had to create that balance within myself and learn. It's not about what I do, it's who I be. Am I showing up with love? Am mm -hmm. I showing up with compassion? Am I saying no when I need to say no? The need is always going to be mm -hmm. there. And really prioritizing myself and not seeing it as a bad thing, because if I don't take care of me, who's going to take care of me? Why did I Why did I adopt the rhetoric that I don't take care of yourself but be mad because somebody didn't show up to take care of you? That didn't make sense. So I had to rewire myself and heal that to myself and say, no, some balls do have to drop. And even as a restorative practitioner, even in my professional work, 
I make sure that I keep myself up because to me, that's the most important thing. How am I feeling? How am I doing? How am I making you feel? It's more important about how I'm making you feel than what we're doing together. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of those things, we don't create space for that. And we need to heal. And then when I started to learn that a lot of things that were culturally gen- uh, passed down to me were very harmful, the way we interact with each other, the way we talk to each other, our expectations and the spaces we create. And so not only did I have to heal for myself, but it was a lot of grieving because the things I was used to doing, I couldn't do no more because they wasn't healthy for me or healthy right. for our family. So I think it's so important. I know it's important. I know that the dark never outpowers the light. Even if it's a match light, it will survive in the dark. So how do we look inside of ourselves and turn on those lights inside of ourselves that really will give the reflection to the world and not doing all these external things for people, places, and things, thinking it's going to create that light that comes from internally. And I think as Black women, people all together, when we just come to that space, as Dr. Cordon said earlier, doing that self-internal reflection and realize, oh my God, everything is burning up. And I've learned in life, my spirit always tell me, don't be a thom- thermometer, be a thermostat. Because the mm. thermometer will tell you what's going on, but the thermostat comes in and regulates and change. And I believe we all have the power to come in and regulate and change. That's the divine power we all are born with. But because of our lack of knowledge and our hurt and our pain and not knowing who we are and what we can do, we get raveled in these things of life that a lot of times don't do us no good. So I think when we definitely create this space and slow down, and it's intentional. I, I intentionally make sure I create this space because we are used to not having it. And if you're used to not having it, you won't have it. So just like, you know, when you do losing weight, you got to intentionally watch what you eat, intentionally do a little exercising. We have to intentionally pause and make sure we love on ourselves. And I hope everybody has a good home girl, home boy, somebody, somebody in your tribe to kind of reflect on you and keep it real with you. Could we all keep it real with each other? Because I think we need to learn how to communicate without being harmful. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say next time I'll blow up. No, we need to be able to address it without being harmful. And this comes because we don't give ourselves space. We don't even talk to ourselves. Just like Tony said, I got to change the thinking to ourselves. So we don't change the thinking to uh, the talking to ourselves. How are we going to even respect each other to talk to each other? Mm-hmm. And even when we're hurt, how do we express our hurt without hurting people? You can express your hurt without being hurtful. Mm-hmm. So these are some things that I hope that we continue. And it's not our fault, you know, it's just, but it's our responsibility to create the change. Mm-hmm. And so that we continue to create these intentional spaces so we can reflect and say, hey, let's make sure we intentionally create any spaces to address a lot of these mental issues that we inherited and have a lot of accepted it, especially when it came through culture and family. Gems, you all are dropping so many gems. Um, and I'm gonna gonna offer a last question, um, inspired uh, by Dr. Shaniqua Smith's T-shirt. There, um, tell tell our listeners what role does food play in community gatherings and healing practices? Well, you know, food is part of my joy. Food is joy. Food is a space. I mean, that that's just a, a that's like air. <laughs> Like even even when you're when you're hosting individuals, and uh, oh, actually with the uh, I went to visit Detroit. They have a food co-op, and they worked 13 years. If you went to the neighborhood, uh, it was so depleted and and abandoned buildings and the conditions that these individuals live in. But you know what? They stuck together collectively over perseverance, and they had their own restaurant. I mean, their own supermarket with good foods. And I walked in the supermarket and on the, on the labels, they had black owned. This person black made this, this person made it. I didn't even know we made tissue. I didn't know we had frozen food. I didn't know we was making toothpaste. I mean, locally, this is not only historically. I know we did great things historically, but it was good to my soul to even see that we were doing these things. And you know, if you want people to be healthy, you got to eat healthy. So if you're, not, if you're not even getting good food, how, how much value you feel as a human that you can't even get good food? Food is so essential and so important. So it was just a beautiful space that we went to. And even on the West Side, working with Darrell, and um, we, we're looking forward to the little uh, restaurant, I mean, the little supermarket that we're going to open up the little storefront to be able to offer fresh food, create a space of knowledge and wisdom so we can teach each other. Because I go into the supermarket today and there's vegetables I have not eaten because I never cooked them. So it's the lack of knowledge. So how many of us that we can cross this bridge to where we can tap into that knowledge we need to feed ourselves, to validate ourselves, and to make ourselves healthy, whole, 
Because if you're not feeling healthy, I mean, wealth is health is part of your wealth. And food definitely contributes to that wealth. So I hope we continue also as people to just start eating differently, you know, because we get together, we're going to get us some fried chicken. But there's some other things we could, don't, don't you know, you can bake that chicken, put something on it and eat it in a more healthier way and just having these conversations and creating different food for ourselves. Yeah, Tony, you can get some good fried chicken in the oven. You know, we got, and, and we got the, what you call it now? What's that new thing they got now that you cook the chicken in without air grease? Fryer. Air fryer. Air Bam. Fryer. Here we go. So. Don't play with me with an air fryer. Don't play with me with an air fryer. I'm trying to tell you, air fryer, I'm trying to tell you right now, for those people that don't know, an air fryer wing will make you hurt yourself. I'm trying to tell you that. When the air, the air fryer, it, that air fryer, I don't know what they did with the air fryer or where the air fryer came from, but I want to thank the people that invented the air fryer because the air fryer wing I'm trying to tell you, an air fryer steak, an air fryer wing, anything that you think that you need grease in the pan for, let me tell you right now, you do not. And let me tell you, let me just, okay, let me just tell you about an air fryer Brussels sprout with mm. a little bit of sprinkled Parmesan on it. I'm trying to tell you right now. Now, I can't, yeah, and listen. Me too. And I, I, didn't mean, I didn't mean to break into a sermon about the air fryer and that the Lord, and, the, and, the, and that the Lord, and that the Lord gave us the air fryer. But what I want to do is tell you that the air fryer is the jam. I don't know the last time I have fried a thing. Uh, and I mean, and, and let me just tell you, and I, and I, and okay, now listen, I'm going to admit this. I love a good hot dog. I love a hot dog. And then occasionally I just get a hankering for one. This too can be altered in the air fryer. You know, that kind of char that you want on it, it can happen in the air fryer. You don't need to fry it up in some grease in the pan. You don't. And now I'm going to really go old school with you. Yep, you can go to the deli, get the thick bologna, throw that in the air fryer and put that on. Come on now. Why are you playing with people's emotions? The air fryer is the air fryer. I'm trying to tell you, don't play around with it now. Get your temperatures right. And if you need a couple of recipes on how to make you a good garlic parmesan wing in the air fryer, Holla at your girl. It's not no, just no, throw it no, in no. there. You got it. You need a little, you need a little flour, flour. You need a little dip, dip. You need a little spray, spray. Then you throw it in there. Don't just go in there raw. Don't go with the chicken raw into the air fryer. That's the piece I can part on because that's the piece I'm gonna give you. And I'm gonna tell you the air fryer is where it's at. Any vegetable, any any protein, you name it. I'm gonna tell you the only thing that mess up in a an air fryer a little bit is a lobster. And my friend told me that you needed to wrap it in a paper towel. Mm. Well, yes. all right. We had a topic of food vibe and stuff. That's what food is. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I'm sorry, ladies. I have to bounce. They, are, if, if I don't bounce to this other thing, they're going to kill me dead. We and that. Let's reframe that. Let's reframe oh, that. Sorry, sorry. They're, they're, they're going to be very upset. Which all right. Is okay. <laughs> that's okay well, that's okay. so happy to to have you tony enjoy thank you talk to you soon ciao and friends with that on behalf of dr shaniqua smith a tony young dr octavia cordon and myself thank you for listening to spilling the black girl tea we invite you to check out our other youtube episodes on the justice and jubilee page and podcast episodes on Accidental Tomatoes Podcasts. Thanks for listening.